Welcome, everybody. A very, very special welcome to those of you who are here present. It is you who make all this possible. I wouldn't be able to speak to an empty church. So sincere thanks. And special greetings also today uh, to the readers and promoters of The Curate's Diary. The September issue of The Curate's Diary went out during the week. And we pray, Lord, that the power of your Holy Spirit may come upon it. We pray, Lord, that lives will be touched through it. And indeed, the talk I'm giving today will be a sort of little extracts from the curate's diary. We pray, Lord, that somebody may have their life blessed in a profound way by the September issue of the curate's diary. And we ask your blessing, Lord, upon all our promoters, that you will bless and reward them for their work. We also ask your blessing for our YouTube family, praying, Lord, that through these videos, that something of your blessing may go out to each member of our YouTube family, wherever they are throughout the world. And thanks to those who give the videos the thumbs up and place the comments underneath or pass on the links to other people. Deeply appreciated. Who was it that said that she planned to spend her time in heaven doing good on earth? St. Therese. And today we're unveiling a statue of St. Therese here in the corner of God's cottage. Um, because we're uh, calling down her blessing upon the program which we're doing here at the present time and praying to her intercession that we will be able to help many people embrace the concept of soul living that not merely will they go to heaven the moment they die but that they'll be able to bring blessing on earth from heaven and we call for God's blessing upon this statue I got one little bit of a shock when I uh, was examining the box the, the statue came in. It says, made in China. Made in China. So many of our religious things are made in China. And there was a sort of a night about that. And then the thought struck me, let us pray that the blessing of the Lord will come upon every statue that's been made in China. And every Bible that's been printed in China. And St. Therese had a special desire for the missions, and I think including China. So we pray um, to the intercession of St. Therese that God's blessing may come upon every statue that's being made in China, and particularly every statue of St. Therese. And we also pray a second little detail concerning things being made in China, uh, probably being made by unbelievers. And uh, maybe, you know, even something negative. So we pray concerning everything that comes into God's cottage, that you will cleanse everything that comes into God's cottage of anything of the evil one. And in particular, that you will bring your blessing upon this statue, that this will be a statue will be a reminder to us that it's possible for us to so live that the moment we die, we'll go straight to heaven and be able to bring blessing upon earth from heaven. And you know, there are billions of saints in heaven. Wouldn't that be true? Billions of saints in heaven. And how many of them are, are we aware of doing great work on earth? Not all that many are there. That, 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 and, but the, the Lord is desiring to raise up more. The Lord is desiring to raise up from amongst ourselves people who will so live in union with him that they will be able to go to heaven the moment they die and will be able to um, bring blessing on earth from heaven. I'll just go off a slight tangent as a way of explaining things. I have a print down frame for making the plates for the printing process. And there's two bulbs in the print down frame. And for some time now I have been having difficulties couldn't understand the difficulties. Uh, the two bulbs are identical, manufactured from the same manufacturer, plugged into the same electricity. And it was only this month when doing the September issue of the Curate's Diary, it struck me that the reason I was having so many problems is that one of the bulbs is now weaker than the other one. Same energy, look to be doing the same thing, but less heat and less light coming from one of the bulbs than coming from the other one. And that that would explain some of the difficulties I've had. I've had other difficulties as well. But it struck me. That's a little bit like the saints in heaven. That the saints in heaven have the same power of God available to them 
the same energy from God available to them, the same love of God to transform them. And some are better at bringing blessing on earth than others. And wouldn't that be our experience? That some saints like Saint Therese, Saint Padre Pio, John Paul II, uh, that they're able to bring great blessings upon earth, whereas there's billions of saints in heaven, and I'm sure they're praying for us, but they don't seem to be as good at bringing blessings upon earth. So our prayer, our desire is to live in such union with God, that not merely will we go to heaven the moment we die, but that we will be able to bring blessing upon earth from heaven. And that involves looking at things in a somewhat different way to the way in which we might have normally looked upon them. We have a sort of a narrow understanding of sin, um, and um, we're not aware of all the times in different ways that we're not exactly in tune with God's will. And that is the process that we're seeking to embark on here, of helping one another not merely to deal with sin, but also to be able to tune our lives into God's plan and God's will for us. And one very important area um, where it's important to tune one's life into God's will, we're not talking about sin, we're talking about tuning one's life into God's will, is in the area of physical illness, physical infirmity, bad things happening to us in this life, things that were done to us, things that upset us in this life. The grace to be able in all these things, to be able to bring them to God and to seek to respond to them in union with Jesus who is within us. And that is a significant area. Is there anybody here who has had no suffering in life? There's not, is there? And is there anybody here who hasn't had some time physical infirmity or bad things done to them or uh, all sorts of things going wrong? There isn't, is there? So the challenge for us is to learn how to bring these things uh, to God and to handle them in tune with his will. And when I was preparing for this talk, and it was in my mind for a couple of months now to do this talk, there was one person above all other, others that I felt led to speak about. And it's a blind priest. He's still alive, 80 years of age approximately, uh, still alive, Father Patrick Martin, Father Pat Martin from America. When he was nine, he got, oh, what's this to call it? <laughs> Uh, meningitis. He got meningitis when he was nine. Uh, he was in a coma for three and a half months. The doctor said he wasn't going to live. In fact, the doctor suggested it would be better to let him die. And um, it came as quite a shock to everybody, to the doctors, uh, when he regained consciousness. But they weren't jumping with joy. Um, they said uh, he's only going to be a vegetable. And Father Pat loves to say, you are now listening to a speaking turnip <laughs> and or a talking turnip, whichever, whichever phrase comes to him. He, he loves to speak of it that way. Uh, again, when he went home, after, three, after a further two months, three and a half months in a coma and further two months, uh, then in hospital he was discharged, but uh, his family were told he would never be able to walk and that he'd be only able to sit up in a special chair with uh, uh, side rests on it and so forth. And he had a big family, I've forgotten now, was it 22 in the family or 23, a big, big family. And his brothers and sisters were determined that that wasn't going to be the, the end outcome. Uh, so they started getting him up, we had parading him down between one another, passing him from one to the other with one on each side and uh, getting his legs to move. And after a few months, uh, he was able to move his legs himself and he was able to gradually develop to be able to walk. He was completely blind at this stage. Later, which was considered a miracle, he received pinpoint vision. Um, he has enough vision to be able to see one letter. When he's reading a book, it has to be one letter at a time. He's only able to see one letter. But before he got the pinpoint vision, one day his father had a workshop. I think he was a carpenter. And he was in his father's workshop. And um, 
I think we have a friend here today who uh, suffers blindness as well and she knows what happens when you're in a strange place and can't see where you're going. He banged himself up badly and um, he howled out in pain after hurting himself. And um, uh, there was a lady in the workshop that day, a customer in the workshop, and she said to him, uh, he was 10 at this stage, when you grow up, God will show you why he made you blind. Now, do you think that was very consoling? Uh, telling a 10-year-old uh, that uh, God had made him blind. He says, imagine telling a 10-year-old that it is God who made him blind and expecting that child to fall head over heels in love with that God. And then, thankfully, um, he, he was obviously a very intelligent person from early on. And um, a, a while later... He wasn't, I think he said he was watching, but he wasn't watching at that stage because he couldn't see. He was present when his um, mother was tucking out the mouth. There was plenty of him to be tucked up in bed, isn't that right? We're 22 in the family or something like 22, 23, I've forgotten. Uh, so there was a lot of tucking up in bed to be done that would have taken a good few minutes every evening. And it suddenly struck him, my mother would not have made me blind. And if my mother would not have made me blind, would God have made me blind? So it suddenly struck him that, no, it wasn't God who made him blind. And he says, um, concerning people who suggest to people that uh, God is responsible for their illness or God is responsible for their infirmity, he says, I get all bent out of shape when I hear people blame God for their sufferings, saying pious things like, God gives us our crosses, we have to carry them. And he adds, that's not scripture. He says, when Jesus was on the cross, he didn't blame God the Father. If he blamed God the Father, he wouldn't have prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what, uh, what they do. He blamed us. He blamed people. Father, forgive them. It wasn't God um, that was responsible. And so, too, when infirmities come our way in life, Whatever has got into the atmosphere, whatever has happened on earth, whatever has affected our genes, it's not God. It's um, true whatever has got into uh, the world that leads to our illnesses. But while God was not responsible for Father Pat to become blind, it was uh, the meningitis, um, once he was able to bring it to God and surrender it to God, God was able to bring mighty blessing into his life and through him into the world. And we pray that grace for each of us. The grace that whatever comes our way, and Lord, we're not asking for anything fresh to come our way, <laughs> but the grace that whatever does come our way, that we'll be able to surrender to you and draw strength from you to deal with it. And we pray for anybody we know who's finding that difficult. Anybody who is struggling with their affliction, their suffering, Lord, we pray your blessing to go out to them. We pray, Lord, that you will touch people in their inner being and the grace to know how much you love them and how truly you are with them. And Father Pat says, blindness has taught me a lot. And it has made me look at other sufferings that have come into my life and look at them with a different eye. What God can do with our broken lives if we let him, he turns everything into a gift. And other big sufferings did come his way. Guess what? Not sure what age, but as a child, he was sexually abused. And he says himself, I was abused as a child, sexually abused. A blind child, sexually abused. You don't get much more despicable than that. Does the world give peace to the abused? No. The world fills us with anger, with hate, with a desire for vengeance, with resentments they can't heal. The abuse left me with all the anger, the hate, the shame, the resentment. An example of how Satan is a liar. A woman is raped. A child is abused, and they are the ones who end up feeling guilty. Many years later, um, I'm going many, many years later, at a certain stage, he believes that Our Lady inspired him, that he was to pray 
a certain rosary each day. And he was praying this rosary for a period when a, a, an inspiration came to, to him. He says, I've been praying that rosary for about a year and a half one morning, when one morning I was led to the very home of the man who had abused me as a child. The amazing thing is that I wasn't led there to confront him, or to ask why, or to seek an apology. I wasn't led to pridefully say I forgive you. No, I went in and accepted a cup of coffee. And he adds, but I skipped out of that man's home on air, realizing I was free. I was no longer bound by the anger, the hate, the resentments, all the garbage that came from the abuse. I was free. He adds, I do pray that before his death, that man found the same freedom and peace from his past as I have found from mine. But my peace does not depend on that. My peace depended on the one who loves me. Now, the one little drawback in his approach there would be he did nothing in a sense to prevent that man from offending again. But maybe he knew the man wasn't going to be in a position to offend again. But that would be the one a drawback. But it's when we reach out the hand of friendship to those who hurt us. I've experienced that myself, not sexual abuse, but it did involve serious physical abuse from a teacher. It was when I reached out the hand of friendship to him in, my, in his old age, that's when I became totally free of the hurt he had brought into to my life. Now, some the teachers took a special interest in Patrick as a young boy. They helped him to learn his lessons. Um, they spent time with him in that way. And because of that, he was able to get through exams. And because of that, then as he grew up, he had been helped and he wanted to help others in the same way. And so he chose to go and join the Brothers of Christian Education. And he was working with them. The fuller stories in the September issue of the Curious Diary. Much more details in the September issue of the Curious Diary. And he was working with them. And then he just developed a desire to go for the priesthood. Now, one, a couple of obstacles to him going for the priesthood. Number one, he just needed a special approval from the Pope, no less, as a blind person to be able to go for the priesthood. At least that was the way back then. But a second one came up. Guess what? The superior in the Brothers of Christian Education wrote to the Bishop of the Diocese advising the bishop against accepting uh, him for the priesthood, saying something to the effect that he'd make a terrible priest. Now, maybe in some ways, he, he, maybe he hadn't been a great teacher. I don't know. But uh, that's what the superior wrote to the bishop. And he was blocked. And he says he was filled with hatred. I became a hateful, bitter man that day. I never hated another man as much in my life. I nursed the hatred. I thought he has to be told off. I longed for the chance to get even. But thank God he put, he put Brother Francis for 100 miles away from me that year. I become a hate addict. <coughs> and um, as the year progressed and his work with the handicapped, as a brother he was doing a lot of work with the handicapped, and his work with the handicapped brought him into another diocese, and uh, the bishop there took a special interest in him, and became a, familiar with his story, and said to himself, wouldn't he make a fantastic priest to work with the handicapped? And uh, so um, he, he got a bishop who was uh, delighted to take him on, uh, got all the permissions from Rome for him to be taken on. And uh, uh, in that way, he ended up becoming a priest and he did become a powerful priest. And thank God it was a bishop that didn't stick him into a parish. He would not have been suitable for parish work. Thank God it was a bishop who saw that his vocation was to reach out to the handicapped and to, to re get missions and retreats. And he has spoken in Ireland on a few occasions and he is powerful, absolutely powerful. But a couple of, uh, a year or so before his ordination, he was praying to God and he was asking God, well, what would you like me to do as a priest? In what way would you like me to minister? And he was praying about this, I think during a retreat, I've forgotten the details. And then as he walked along, a song came into his mind. 
He says he had never written a song before. He would never written a song since. But a, a lovely, simple little song came into his mind. Now, when I was doing up the article for the diary and wanting to check the words of the song that I, that I had him correct, uh, I googled Father Pat Martin and He Loves Me, which is the name of the song. And guess what? Um, I was able to go right in where he's singing it on YouTube in the nursing home. He's now in at 80 years of age and he was really still singing it gusto. I'm not going through, through the full six verses here, but basically the song was, he loves me. He loves me exactly as, as, he, as I am. He can bring blessing to me as I am. He can use me as I am. I, uh, all I need is to love him in return. The final verse, he loves me. He loves me as I am. Oh, yes, he loves me. Finding me wherever I am, he gently guides me by the hand, for he loves me as I am. Oh, he loves me. For he loves me as I am. Oh, he loves me. So a very simple little song with the total assurance that God loved him. He didn't get direction as to what he was to do during his ministry. The direction he got was, and the direction that God desires to give to every person here this day is, he loves you. God loves you as you are. And whatever your history in life, God loves you as you are. And whatever your history in life, God desires to bring blessing into your life as you are and through you into the world as um, you are. And we pray for that grace. Lord, we pray for the grace to, for each person here today to know that you love us exactly as we are. Whatever has happened in our past, even our own mistakes, Lord, you love us as we are. You desire to bring blessing into our lives as we are. There may be a need for repentance, but uh, that's a step with the Lord. But uh, the Lord, Lord, you desire to bring blessing into our lives. You desire to work through us. You desire to enable us to bring blessing to others. And we make that prayer, Lord, not just for each person here present, but for each person watching this video. The grace, Lord, to know that you love us as we are. The grace, Lord, to trust that as we seek to walk with you, to surrender to you and walk with you, that you will bless us and that you will bring blessing to us. And also there are some people, and I got an email from a person, I think it was yesterday, uh, who I thought would have had a deep sense of God's love for them, but doesn't. I pray, Lord, for anybody either here present or watching on YouTube, who does not have a deep sense of God's presence in their life. Lord, I pray for them. Whatever it takes, Lord, to lead them into a situation where they can have a personal encounter with you, to lead them into a situation where they can come to know you as their best friend, to lead them into the situation where they will have an experience of their love, just as you brought Father Pat the experience of your love, that you will lead each person to a situation where we know that you love us and that you are with us. Now, after his ordination, he was doing some school retreats as well. And at the end of one school retreat, um, uh, the person who got up to thank him at the end uh, of the retreat uh, says, uh, thank you, Father Pat, for being blind. <laughs> now, that rubbed them up the wrong way first, shall we say. Uh, wouldn't it rub anybody up the wrong way? And he was, uh, he was thinking, well, would you thank somebody for having cancer? Or would you thank somebody for their marriage breaking up? Or would you thank somebody for this, that, or other bad thing that had happened to them or a me medical condition they were in? And he was, he was praying about this and struggling with this and a bit annoyed about this. And uh, as he was bringing it before the Lord, um, he got a sort of vision. And the vision he got was of three men carrying crosses. You know what that's about. Uh, three men carrying crosses. 
um, two of them were, especially one of them, but two of them were reacting badly to their cross and uh, complaining about their cross and begrudging their cross. And the third one was taking time to stop and speak to people along the way. And you know, you know who that was. And he got that vision and he says, God, let me feast on that beautiful picture for a while. Then he said to me, you see, Patrick, that the world dumps crosses on all my people. The world dumps suffering on all my people. The world seeks to destroy all my people. But when you accept, embrace, and even love what the world does to you, then you can be thanked for it. Just as you thank my son for the cross the world dumped on him. He accepted, loved, and turned that cross into a gift of redemption for all humanity. You can do the same, Patrick. Blindness can be something that you wish that you wish had never happened to you. Or you can embrace it and make it the gift of your whole life. There's a remarkable testimony of how God worked through his blindness. Haven't time to go into individual incidents. A couple of them are in the September issue of the Curate's Diary, when because of his blindness, uh, God worked through him. Um, on one occasion, for example, uh, he was picked up to go speak at a, a retreat or a conference, and he says that the lady who picked him up, uh, he couldn't get her to speak to him on the way to the conference, and on the way home he couldn't get her to stop, stop speaking. <laughs> Uh, that she had been so moved by the, the by his talk, and she ended up making a confession of I don't know how many years, um, but a lifelong confession uh, to him on the car on the way back. And it wasn't the only time that that happened, but uh, how God has worked through him because of his blindness, how God has uh, been able to bring blessing into the life of others through his blindness. And uh, he ended up being able to say, God, you didn't make me blind, but I thank you for the gift you have made out of my blindness. And we pray, Lord, that prayer for each of us, whatever our affliction is, and we all have afflictions. We all have little things that have gone wrong for us, and as we get on in years, there's a few more little things beginning not to work too well. And we, we thank you, Lord. We surrender them all to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you, that you can work through all these things and that as we surrender them to you that you have a plan for each of us lord i thank you that you have a plan for each one of us whether we're young or not so young or quite elderly we thank you lord that you still have a plan for each one of us and we thank you lord that as we surrender all things to you as we surrender everything in our lives to you we thank you that you can bring blessing out of the different afflictions that have come our way. Jesus on one occasion told St. Faustina, there is but one price at which souls are bought, and that is suffering to you, united to my suffering on the cross. So whatever constitutes suffering in our lives, I invite you now, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He loves you. Become aware that your suffering can become an extension of his suffering. And that when your suffering becomes an extension of his suffering, then blessing can be released. Now, it doesn't mean that we always have to be totally happy about our sufferings, do we? It doesn't. Uh, on the cross, uh, Jesus prayed, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Incidentally, those are the opening lines of Psalm 22. Jesus was praying the Psalms on the cross. And what great many Catholics do not know is that many of the Psalms, they begin to cr with crying out to God, and then they move to expressing faith in God. And that is true of Psalm 22 as well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Cry the pain out to the Lord. I remember many years ago, it was just before the year 2000, and just before the euro came in, uh, just coming up to the new year, uh, when my secretary of many years uh, explained that she was leaving. And I hadn't a clue how I was going to be able to manage uh, over the, the, the busy Christmas period without her. And I turned to God and I found myself crying out, Dear Lord, I'm desperate. 
And I had been working on a booklet at that stage and I hadn't come up with a title for, for it. And it certainly struck me. It was a perfect booklet uh, for a perfect title for the booklet. And that's how the little booklet, Dear Lord, I'm Desperate, got its name. But cry out, you're yeah, praying to God. That's okay. That's okay. Don't come in and say, Lord, I'm lovely and happy, if you're far from lovely and happy. Come in and tell the Lord exactly how you feel. And then have a sense of uniting your suffering with the suffering of Jesus. And we'll now have a wee blessing before the Blessed Sacrament again. Lord Jesus, we do love you. And I pray for each person here present, the grace, whatever difficulties they have faced in their lives, the grace, this I write at this moment, to be able to surrender everything to you and the grace to be able to trust that you do have a way forward the grace to be able to trust that you will be with each of us every day of our lives the grace to be able to so live to so handle the different things burdens that come into our lives the grace that we will so live that not merely will we go to heaven the moment we die, but like St. Therese, we will be able to bring blessing from heaven. And I invoke the intercession of St. Therese for anybody who is finding this difficult to comprehend. St. Therese, through your intercession, I pray for each person the grace to get a vision of how they can so live here on earth that they will be able to bring blessing from heaven to earth. We pray now to come under your blessing and under your anointing. And we bring that to you as well, Lord. Um, one Sunday, there, a few Sundays ago, I had planned to give a talk on the, what one might call the great cleansing of one's life. Uh, as it happened, other things cropped up, and so I only touched on it. Next Sunday, at the moment, unless something crops up, I'm planning on uh, giving the full talk on having a life cleansing, step by step and stage by stage. Um, so that, please God, will be next Sunday. And may the Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.